<clears throat> and I'm going to drop. I was reading them last night and decided to drop two of the poems that I was that uh, we've got assigned for Thursday, uh, 17 and 18. We'll just take off. Um, more than likely, 27 is going to take a long time, anyways. So <clears throat> that's assuming we get through everything we need to um, today. So let's turn. Turn to um, the first poem, On the Father, which is on page 37. <clears throat> we'll do the first five, um, and then 7, 11, and 15, if we, if we get to them all. And I don't plan on uh, reading all the way through each of the poems. I just want to talk about um, specific lines. Maybe some of them will read all the way through. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the form or structure of them at all because I don't know Greek. <laughs> and translated into English, they lose their, uh, those that are written in hexameter or tetrameter, etc. Um, they lose their structure entirely. So, beginning with On the Father. <clears throat> um... Look at, at what he says in the first couple lines. I, I don't want to address the first couple lines at great length, other than the image that he uses. I know we are as though making a great voyage on a raft, or hastening towards the starry sky upon small wings. What does he mean with those images? It's a real meagerness. Okay. And impermanence, too. Okay. Meagerness, impermanence. Okay, I mean, making a great voyage on a raft. Why a raft? It's unstable. It's unstable. What else? It's small. It's small. Okay. And what about the voyage? The voyage is great. It's great. It's huge. Well, take those... Take that image and apply it now to what he's writing about. What's the topic of the poem? God the Father. Okay. So what's he saying about his poem? Insignificant. But we're, we're not even going to scratch the surface, as it were. Or hastening towards, I like this one even better, the starry sky upon small wings. Well, the starry sky is all out there, and how far can you get on small wings? Not far at all, okay? When, with such poems, mind has moved to exhibit the Godhead. Mind has moved, that is, mind has been inspired to say something about the Godhead, God the Father, okay? So, he doesn't say, therefore, you know, let's all give up and go home. He's obviously going to keep speaking. So lines 9 and 10 tells us essentially who the poem is directed to. My speech is directed either to the pure or to them that are being purified. That is, it's either directed, probably what he means by pure is to Christians or to those who are in the process of becoming Christian. I have to keep in mind in Gregory's day, uh, as was true in Basil's and uh, will be true in Chrysostom's, and as was true all the way back to St. Ignatius and earlier, you didn't become a Christian overnight. You didn't become a Christian merely by showing up at church and asking Jesus in your heart. You, the process of becoming Christian was long and drawn out. It, it, it involved a period of what's called the catechumenate, Catechumenate, when you became a catechumen, okay, that's when you start to learn 
about the faith. Okay? The catechumen it begins with a ceremony, a ritual, part of the church. Uh, it involves an exorcism, not like William Peter Blatty's exorcism, <laughs> but you know, prayers said over you, hands laid on you, you turn and spit on the devil and all this kind of stuff. Okay? But then you are a catechumen for a period of time. It could be short, it could be years. Okay? A lot of it depends on what your background was, what you were coming from in joining the church. I mean, if you had been a priest of one of the mystery religions or something, then you've got a little bit more to unlearn, as it were. Okay? So that's what he's talking about, to them that are being purified, those who are in the process of, of becoming Christian. Because he's not, when he talks about to the pure, he doesn't mean to perfect individuals. Because no one here really is perfect. Okay? But infidels like wild beasts, when on the high peak mountain Christ shone forth and wrote the law for Moses upon tablets, were immediately overcome beneath the broken crags. He's saying, I'm not writing for you. Why? You won't understand. Okay? You won't get this. All right? So, skip down quite a bit to line 25. He kind of, you know, everything before line 25 is almost like prologue. It's, it's not really what he wants to get at. But here's what he wants to get at. There's one God, without beginning or cause, not limited by anything before or afterwards to be, encompassing the eons and infinite, the noble great only begotten Son's great Father. Notice how he defines God in relation to the Son, or the Father, in relation to the Son, who had in the Son no suffering of anything fleshly, since he is mine, meaning God is pure mind, one other is God. Why? Because God is Trinity. So if he's going to mention Father and he's going to mention Son, he's going to mention Spirit. Uh, one other is God, not other in Godhead. In other words, he's not talking about a third God, but a third, the language that the church will use, hypostasis, or person um, in the Trinity. Okay. Oh, where Gregory and Elizabeth are. Gregory is really sick. Oh, is he? Because he was sitting outside yeah, earlier. He came, and I, but I was like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> I saw him and I was wondering. Elizabeth was across earlier today. So, um, so he goes on, who is, his, who is his living paternal seal, that is, the Spirit is the paternal seal, the seal of the Father. Well, where do you see that? When Christ is baptized, what does John see? The Spirit descending and it's a dove, okay, and lands on Christ, etc. Um, the soul, son of him, blah, 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 okay? So he hits all of the theological details in that poem. He hits Trinitarian theology. Okay? Now look at the sun. First of all, we shall sing the sun, honoring that blood which is our passions cleansing. That is, the blood of the sun is the blood that cleanses us from our passions. All right? Um, skip a few lines, go on down to... Well, I don't even know how to count these because that's not five lines. Um, looks like eight or nine. Okay? The eternal son, the archetype's image. God the Father is the archetype. Okay? The son is the image of the Father. Again, he's probably basing that on the book of Hebrews where it talks about Christ being the express image of God's glory. Okay? A nature equal to his parent. Why? Because they have the same essence. Consubstantiality is the term that's used by the fathers. For the Son so great is the Father's glory, and from him, that is from the Father, he shone forth, as only the Father and he that shone forth from the Father understand. No one understands the Father, Christ says, unless I show him to them. Okay? 
So, skip on down a little bit. Line 15. Can we hit up uh, 13? Which line is that? Just <laughs> um, I have no right to foist on the Godhead a birthday. I have no right to foist on the Godhead a birthday. What does he mean by that? There's no period before. There's no, yeah. Okay. The son, is, now, especially. the son is eternally begotten of the Father. Sure. Okay. okay. But there is no point, contrary to Arius, there is no point at which the son was not. Did not exist. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That's what he means there. Okay. Nor does he call him merely an emission, he says. Okay. I've no right to foist on the Godhead a birthday, an emission, or some loathsome cutting. That is, that the son is somehow a, a portion of the father that is you know, down here on earth. The son is distinct from the father in his personhood. He's the same as the father in his essence. Okay? Does that address Arianism? Yeah. Okay. So that's why he goes on and says, for though I do not reproduce dispassionately, and he means here I as a human being. Why? Because I'm composite. I'm soul and flesh, not at all subject to passion, is he who is wholly incomposite, unbodied. That is, the Father, who is not subject to passion. All the language in the Old Testament, and even the New Testament, that talks about, you know, God, God being angry, God repented of having created Adam and Eve, you know, God repented of the world at the time of Noah and everything. All of that language, the fathers say, when, when God changes his mind, so to speak, the fathers say that that language is directed at us so that we can understand what's going on, but that God literally doesn't repent. He doesn't literally feel anger. He doesn't literally have love, per se. Why? Because each of those is a changeable emotion, and God is unchangeable. He's eternally the same. Right? That's why God is, when he says, he who is holy in composite. That is, he's one essence. He's not a composite of other things. All right? Um, when things' natures are remote, like God's nature, when things' natures are remote, what wonder if their beginnings differ too? If time came before me, time is not before the Word, whose begetter is a temporal. Okay, the begetter of the word is God the Father. All right, and he's outside time. When the beginningless Father was there, leaving nothing superior to his divinity, that's going back to what Saint Athanasius was talking about in the on the Incarnation, when he's talking about Plato, because Plato believed that there were things before God. Then also was there, that is before time, the Father's Son having in the Father a timeless beginning. What does that mean? It means, to use the phrase I used before, the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. He's eternally produced, you could say. I shouldn't because the fathers don't use that term. Eternally um, begotten is the only term they use of the Father. And they use that term begotten, why? Because if something begets something else, it begets it of the same nature. But if I produce something, I don't necessarily produce it of myself. You know, I produce this syllabus. The syllabus is not of my nature, however. Okay, But the son is of the same nature as the father. Which is why he then goes on and says, All ideas fall short of the great God. What does he mean? I think part of our discussion is really getting at it. It's beyond imagination. It's the idea that the greatest thing you can imagine it is still greater than that. Exactly. It's beyond understanding. It's beyond words. So even though we use the terminology of the eternal begetting, the eternal begottenness of the Son, that is as far as our human language and logic can reach, okay? So that's why he says, 
while all ideas fall short of the great God, so that nothing interposes, nothing stands between Father and Son eternally existing, we should still, I threw in the still, we should distinguish the Lord the Son from the Lord the Father. That is, we should differentiate between them, not in their godness, not in their essence of divinity, however. So, if something came prior to God, such as time or will, he says that would divide the Godhead, I think. It would say, hmm, if there's something that stands before God, then there's something dividing God up, because what does he say about God earlier? It's before time. And he really encompasses all of time. So, to be God, to be begetter, he must be the great begetter. And if the greatest thing concerning the Father is that his treasure of divinity has no origin, it's no less for the honored offspring of the great Father to have such root. So don't exclude God from God. That is, don't exclude God the Son from God. Godness. Okay? Again, it's an anti-Aryan mentality. Okay? For you've not known the child distance from the Father. The terms unbegotten and begotten of the Father do not make two kinds of Godhead. Someone, and notice he doesn't name names, someone has alleged about this that each is foreign to the other, but the nature is inseparable. When he says each is foreign to the other, what he means is someone has said that God, the Father, is foreign to, different from, God the Son. It's Arius. But he's saying it's not true, all right? Um, da -da -da. But, though the word is begotten, he is not fleshly. That is, he's not begotten like when um, the book of Numbers or the opening of Matthew say, and so and so begat, so and so and so and so begat, so and so and so. You know, it's not a fleshly generation like that. Since his father will be admitted as fleshless fleshless. And no man's mind is ever so corrupt as to think otherwise. And so you have God the Fun, God the Son, not God the Fun, his parents' worthy pride and joy. All right? Um, look at 42. But if rendering offerings to the great Father's Godhead worthlessly, and gravenly in your heart a hollow fear, you deny this thing. That is, if you would deny that the Son is equal to the Father, and would hurl Christ out amongst creatures. Okay, Arius said that the Son is the first creature, the first created thing of God, created long before anything else was, okay, but the first created. So he says, if you would do this, you insult. Look at the next phrase, O nitwit. Now, again, I don't know what the Greek reads, but it's got to be something that O nitwit in modern English appropriately translates. So he's saying anybody who says that is someone of little intellectual uh, ability. So what do you do if you hurl out Christ? He says you insult the divinity of both. You filch the son's divinity who's not God if created. I mean, because God can't be created, because then what created God? And that thing that did the creating would then be God. For all that once was not is but a creature, whatever that is. Which is why, you know, they will, the, the fathers will argue against the um, the Greek conception of essentially matter times time times chance. Or what you could even, you know, to some extent you could call modern, you know, some version of evolution. Okay, I'm not saying that they're necessarily anti-evolution um, per se, but this idea that matter is eternally existent. They would definitely argue against. Okay. 
So, why, bold sir, when your starting point was this, that through God's sufferings you may become God hereafter, that is, through Christ's sufferings, you can become God. Do you then make him go in chains and call him your co-slave, honoring him with gifts for slavery instead of for being God? Okay, and there were other um, heretics, and I'm trying to remember, it wasn't the Martianites, and it wasn't really Manich Manichees, who argued that Christ was a creation of God that was designed to raise us up to a certain level, but that Christ was still, no matter what, a creation, okay? And it seems to be that that's what he's getting at here. Why do you argue, if this is your start, starting point, that you can become godlike, okay, if, he says, Christ's sufferings aren't God's sufferings? Okay? I mean, the, the point that St. Athanasius makes in, on the Incarnation is that what does God do? God condescends to come down, to enter earth, to be born as a child, to do what? To suffer, to take on humanity's sins, and in doing so, to, to then die, to enter hell, to take the dead out of hell, and to open a way okay, to heaven. And in doing what? In being resurrected and then ascending to heaven. Taking humanity in his own body, in his own flesh, back up to God. So, that's what he means by God became man so that man might become God. Alright? Go down to 57. If it's that, that is, if the Word took on flesh to rescue you from your passions, he took on a body. Would you therefore set a yardstick on his great famed Godhead? That is, if, back up a little bit, if the great God formed him later, that is Christ, as a fine tool. That is, he formed me as the greatest thing. Um, the end of that. As a fine tool, so that by his firstborn hand, God might make me then far worthier than the celestial Christ would be the creature, if for its sake the word exists, not if, not it for Christ. Who would maintain such a thing? Why would God make Christ and make him in such a way that he would be able to redeem me so that I would rise higher than even Christ. He said, that's ridiculous. Okay? For he didn't, line 60, back to that line that he used earlier about, can't find it, about cutting off God. Um, he didn't shave off any bit of Godhead, and still he saved me, stooping as a doctor over my foul-smelling passions. Now, stooping as a doctor implies, as a doctor doing what? Leaning over somebody's gangrenous wound, okay? Stooping as a doctor over my foul-smelling passions. He was a man, but God. Notice that's about the shortest line in the entire poem. He was a man, but God. That is simultaneously. David's offspring, but Adam's maker. David's, David's great, 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 great grandson, but the one who made Adam. A bearer of flesh, but even so beyond all body. From a mother, but she a virgin. Comprehensible, that is, as human, comprehensible. People could understand him. People could see him. People could feel him and touch him. But immeasurable. In other words, comprehensible but incomprehensible. Okay, notice the difference there between comprehensible, understandable, but not comprehendable, handleable, as it were. As a man he entered the arena, but he prevailed as indomitable. Okay, what was the arena? cross and death but he prevailed as indomitable over the tempter in three bouts it's like a boxing match 
Okay? He got baptized, but he washed sins clean. Notice, he got baptized, but he washed sins clean. He was proclaimed by the Spirit in a voice of thunder to be the one, to be the son of the one uncaused. As a man, he took rest, and as God, he put to rest the sea. It's a beautiful line when you think about it. The, the stilling of the waters on the Sea of Galilee, you know, in that passage in the Gospels. Where is Christ in the boat when the storm comes up? Sleeping. He's down in the hull asleep. Storm's tossing everything. The guys are all afraid. Peter comes and wakes Jesus up. Jesus gets up, you know, essentially snaps his fingers, and the storm is at rest. All right? His knees were wearied, but he bolstered the strength and knees of the lame. Okay, what's he doing throughout all of these lines? Contradiction or juxtaposition. Okay, he's juxtaposing kind of the eternal aspect of Christ's actions with his momentary day-to-day -day activity. Did Christ get tired? Yes. Yes. Did he get thirsty? Yes. Did he have to go to the bathroom? Yes. Did he have to? Okay. He prayed, but who was it who heard the petitions of the feeble? Okay. Who did he pray to? His father. But he hears, we're told, the petitions of the feeble. He was the sacrificed, but the high priest. Well, the priest is the one who makes the sacrifice. So what was he doing? Here I am. <laughs> he sacrifices himself, making an offering. But again, who's an offering made to? God. But he was God. So you have God, the Son, offering himself in his human nature to God the Father. It's not God the Son in his divinity that dies on the cross. It's God the Son in his human nature that dies on the cross. But, as St. Augustine says, his human nature could not be kept dead. Why? Because he was the author of life. Okay? So, a cross carried him up while the bolts nailed fast sin. Notice, the bolts didn't nail him fast. The bolts nailed sin fast. Okay? He had company with the dead, that is, he descended into the grave, but he rose from the dead, and the dead, the bygone, he raised up. And there's all kinds of hymns of the early church. Next time I do this class, I'm probably going to do a little bit, if I do this class again, a little bit less on the theology and, and more of the hymnody and such. Um, there's a lot of hymns of the, of the early church that talk about the descent into hell and how when Christ leaves hell and is resurrected, what happens to hell at that point? Doors are thrown open. In fact, the doors are removed so that hell is like a, a penitentiary with no gates, no doors on the walls. So anybody who is in hell wants to be there. Anybody who doesn't want to be there can leave. Okay? So, don't you dishonor then his divinity on account of his human things. That is, don't dishonor his godness because of his humanity. Which is what it was thought Arius was doing. Arius thought he was defending the divinity of God the Father. Okay? But for the divine sake, hold and renown the earthly form into which thoughtful toward you. In other words, he became human, thoughtful, mindful of you. He formed himself, the incorruptible son. And what he's doing with that ending is saying, he became the incorruptible son for you, the individual reader, the individual auditor of this poem. Okay? Comments, questions? Okay, look at On the Holy Spirit. Man, I'm tired. On the Holy Spirit, not Spirit. Um, so, why delay? Sing also the Spirit's glory. Why? I've hit the Father, I've hit the Son. Have to get the triad. And don't separate in speech what the nature did not 
leave out. In other words, don't create a division. Don't create a distinction. Because in their nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all the same. All right? So, let's quake before the Great Spirit, who is my God, who made me know God, who is God there above, and who forms God here, etc. Go down to line 9. Of identical honor, meaning worthy of the same devotion, worthy of the same dignity, worthy of the same honor. Now, if someone seeks to understand the Heavenly Spirit's divinity through the pages of divinely inspired law, meaning scripture, he shall see many ways, close packed, collected into one. If he has yearned and gathered something of the Holy Ghost with his heart, and if his piercing mind has perceived. Notice, the mind has to be piercing. It has to be really looking. Why? Well, he's going to tell us in this poem that one of the reasons the Holy Spirit is hidden in the Old Testament is because it wasn't his time yet. But he is still there. All right? So, line 24. As of old, the scriptures displayed the whole deity of the royal father, and Christ's great fame began to dawn, disclosed to men of little under, uh, middle, men of little understanding. So also, later when the sons shone more distinctly, that is, when his deity shone more distinctly, the brightness of the Spirit's deity glowed. Well, where do you see... Christ's fame begin to dawn. Now, you could say, obviously, in the beginning of the New Testament, okay, the baptism, turning the water into wine at the wedding of Cana, you know, all those various miracles and stuff. So what's he saying here? He's saying the Old Testament's primarily about God, the Father. And then we begin to see a movement towards the Son. We, we do see the Son in the Old Testament. Whenever you have an angel of the Lord who speaks to individuals, okay, that's often interpreted to be the pre-existing son. That is, that's the son of the father, but not in his human incarnation. Okay? A good you know, example, a Trinitarian example used in the Old Testament is, let us make man in our image. Us. It's plural. Okay, so what does he say? Once the sun is made known, then it's time to move towards the spirit. Because what does the sun say? I've got to go, and when I leave, I will send a comforter, another. That is, Old Testament for the Father, Gospels largely for the Son, and the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament, the founding of the church and everything. It's all the action of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, to them, he gave a small illumination, while most he left to us, even distributing himself to us later in tongues of fire, the gift at Pentecost. Okay? So, skip several lines. Go on down to 40. Remembering these, that is these things he's been talking about, don't you be a little any within the Godhead. Don't belittle the Son. Don't belittle the Spirit. Putting this one above, this one below. In other words, the Trinity, if you were to represent them, doesn't look like this. Okay? It's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One, two, three. It's... Father, Son, mm. Holy Spirit. Okay? Or, if anything, like that. But it's continually moving. That's why, you know, the legend of St. Patrick was he used the shamrock as an example of the Trinity. Why? Because these three leaves are what? They're all part of the same single leaf. It's this aspect 
its leafness, that was its godhood, its divinity. Okay? And yet there are three nodes, no, etc. So one is the nature, immeasurable, uncreated, atemporal, excellent, free, co-venerable. That refers to divinity itself. One God in three refulgencies. A refulgency is a splendor. Three splendors making the world go around. By these I am awakened, another new young man. When in the font, death gets buried. Okay, and what he's talking about there is baptism. Baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For the threefold Godhead made, made me rise out a light bearer. A Lucifer is what that, nerm, that term really means. Okay. If having been washed in the divinity, and he means baptized in the Trinitarian name, I should divide the bright divinity, it would have been better if, and he doesn't finish. I don't even want to go there. Why? Because he says, I shudder to even complete the sentence. Right? So, whatever man's a sinner, lying 52 or so, can assert the inequality, cutting himself asunder from God's gift. Well, what's God's gift? His own divinity. That is, if you assert an inequality in the Godhead, then what do you do? You remove yourself from the possibility of joining to it, of communion with that Godhead. The development into the likeness of God, okay, that we saw St. Basil and St. Uh, Athanasius allude to. Going down to 60. From unity is the Trinity, and from Trinity, again, the unity. What's the unity? The Godhead, the, the divine essence. Not as a source, a spring, a mighty river, sharing a single current, in three separate manners traverse the earth. That is, they're not the same in the sense that, you know, water, whether the water is in the ocean or in a well or in a spring. He's not, he says no. Nor is a torch taken from a pyre converges again in one nor like a word, both going out from the mind and remaining in it. Nor like, so why does he use all these images and say, it's not really like this, and it's not like this, and it's not like this, and it's not like this. Back to the beginning of the semester in that word I used. Apophatic. Because we can't state definitively what it is like. We don't have language for it. Okay? Approaching, then fleeing, fleeing, then drawing. Why? For God's nature is not restless, nor flowing, nor again a coalescing. But what is God's is steadfast. It's eternal. It's immutable. It's unchanging. It's always the same. Because each one of these images that he just used, they're all... Changing, okay? A spring does what? Dries up. The water is never the same either. What else? A torch? What does flame do? It moves, okay? Words die. Shimmering of dancing sunbeams off the waters? It's, notice, I mean, the very evanescence of it, it's constantly changing. No. 73. In the Godhead is the unity, but they whose Godhead, but they whose Godhead it is, are three in number: Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each is the one God. If you should talk of them singly, if you're going to talk about just the Son, He is God. If you're going to talk about just the Spirit, He is God. If you can talk about just the Father, He is. God. 
There is one God without beginning. Whence comes the wealth of Godhead? And what he means by wealth is he means the complete richness, the fulsomeness of Godhead. Okay? And whenever the world word, whenever the word refers to all three, so that on the one hand, it might reverently proclaim to men the threefold lights. And on the other hand, that by it we might extol the strong, shining monarchy, that is the Father, and not content ourselves with a pluralist marketplace of gods. For by me, polyarchy, that is a multiplicity of gods, a pantheistic religion, and an utter brawling anarchy are one and the same. That is, many and none, exactly. A pagan really, uh, religious system and an atheist are essentially the same for Gregory Nazianzus. But one is the might of my trinity, line 87 or so. One the knowledge, one the glory, one the power. So again, the unity cannot dissolve, being greatly honored, and the one, and I like this, harmony of divinity. It's the one harmony of the three in one. Okay. What did I say we're doing? One, two, one, two, five, and seven. Okay. Uh, concerning the world. Page 48. Notice what he says, line two. Okay, now. Let's, let's hymn the great God's creation contending against false views. Now, if you read the introduction, one of the things the introduction talks about is the, the, at times, didactic nature of Gregory's verse. That is, some of his poems are written to teach. Others of his poems aren't. Sometimes they're just to express, you know, um, what his soul is going through at, at the time. This is obviously a teaching poem. So how does it begin? One is God. But by contrast, the Greek sage's fable is feeble. And I'm imagining there's that wordplay in the Greek too. Which makes out matter and the ideas to be like him without beginning, like I had up here. Okay? Epicurus, Plato. Probably who he has in mind there for those Greek sages because he mentions the forms in the very next line. But whoever saw matter which has no looks, or who has seen an immaterial form? That is, if it's a form, if it's an ideal, it's got to have structure, even if he's striven much with a turmoil of mind. And what he's saying is, this is a ludicrous notion. This doesn't make any logical sense. But if things were, skipping several lines, talking about if things were blended together, line 13 or so, if things were commingled, how did they get to be mingled? That is, if matter, which always existed, suddenly mixed, how? Who mingled them if not God? And it's the question about the Big Bang. What made boom? Okay. But if God's the mixer, well, okay, then accept him as creator of all. If God's the mixer, then don't say that God merely took what was already existent and shook it up. Why not just say God was the creator of that which we thought was eternally existent? Credit God with more than you do our mind, O lover of no origins. No origin, no beginnings. To think we're just a continuation of slime or something. No, line 20. He thought and things came to be. That is, God merely thought, boom, and there was light. He thought and there was dry land. He thought and there was... And what did he do? He informed. Think about that meaning for a minute. If you were informed of something, you were told about it. 
But what does it mean in this context? Formed in. Okay. That is, the form didn't come from outside. It wasn't some Greek platonic ideal that made whatever is, is. No. God took the form from his mind and then made it in existence. The divine thought is the complicated womb of all that is. The great mother, if you want. If you want. Okay. Now, skip down. He talks about the Manichees and a few others. Skip down to 32 or 33. I am a soul and body. Right? The one, an efflux of divinity. Meaning, a creation, a product of divinity. Right? It's usually taken that um, when Genesis says, and God breathed the soul of life, or God breathed, gave the spirit of life through the nostrils, that that's the giving of a soul to Adam, right? And a flux of divinity of infinite light. What does he mean there? If you take that literally, then that means every individual has a divine stamp, so to speak. A divine serial number, if you want. So that means every individual is extremely important and valuable and worthwhile and unique. So the loss of one is an incalculable loss. The other was formed for you from a murky root. What's the murky root? Dirt. Okay. The body was formed from a murky root root from the root being Adam and that's what he means there but these were too far apart that is the body and soul you've gathered into one going down to 45 the course of the sun has brought up fearful winter's cold the one who was first among heavenly lights destroyed by his presumption light and honor and bears eternal enmity to the race of men. He's talking about Lucifer. Okay, The first of the heavenly lights. The highest created being. Okay, Higher than the cherubim and seraphim that stand around, sit around, whatever it is. God's throne. Satan was, you know, above them. And what did he do? He destroyed by his presumption both his light and his honor. Okay, and bears eternal enmity, not to God, to us, to humanity. Why? Because let us now make man in our image. Okay. So he goes on and talks about, you know, what happened to Adam and Eve and such. Um, go to 66. Uh, now go to 70. All things are immediate to God. As much things future as things past. All things are immediate. Means all things for God are now. All what we consider as, as linear chronological time to God is now. Time for me is fractured in this way with some things earlier, others later. But for God it all comes in one. And the great Godhead, what? Engulfs it in his arms. Think of what that means. What does God do? Scoops it all up into his arms like a parent hugging a child. All of time. And if, if all of time, then all of what? All of human activity. And says, it's mine. Okay? So you have the image there of Creation of the world, end of the world, the incarnation, the resurrection, the crucifixion. It's all now. Which is probably what St. Paul means when he says, you know, before the foundations of the world, Christ was crucified. Why? Because in God's mind, let us make man in our image 
happened at the same time as it is finished. It is done. Okay. So, 77. He wanted first, that is, this is what happens when God brought things to view. He wanted first to establish the nature of mind, both celestial, that is angelic beings, and earthly, that is human mind, as a transparent mirror of the primal light. Okay, now keep in mind this is done through the Word. Okay? The Word is the, is the one who actually does the creating. So why does the Word create? Because he wants to make images of the primal, the divine mind. And so you have a celestial image, the angelic beings, which are pure mind, okay? And then you have the human, which is a composite, as he says, a mixture of soul and body. Both gleaming upwards. The idea there is as of mirrors. Well, what are both mirrors doing? They're reflecting the divine light. Okay. As the Lord's attendant, full shining, immense, directing his fame this way, fountaining divinity, that is, giving off divinity, so that he might both rule over others in heaven and be for yet more a light shedding blessings. That is, he rules over those in heaven, the angels, and for more humans to shed blessings upon us. Right? Why? Because it's my Lord's own very nature to grant bliss. He can't help himself. It's part of the Godhead, part of the nature of divinity to grant bliss. Therefore, skip to 87. Therefore, in loving concern for those yet to be for those not yet born, the lofty word cast away from the Trinity whatever light lay round the throne. I'm almost, you get this image that there's spare light just kind of laying around there. And so he picks it up and throws it. In human nature, away from angelic choirs. The angel's nature, not too far removed, a helper, but ours indeed quite far removed, since our existence is from earth mixed with divinity, whereas the simpler nature's better. What's the simpler nature? The angelic. Constantly in the presence of God. Now, of these worlds, the firstborn was that other heaven, the region of those who bear the divine, perceptible to minds only, that is, in the presence of God, all luminous, all full of light. To it, the man of God wins his way from here later. Wins means he wanders. He makes his way. Okay, The man of God, notice, makes his way to heaven later. Once he's perfected as God. Know you, St. Peter writes in 1 Peter, Know you not that you shall be partakers of the divine nature. Okay? He's perfected as God, purified in mind and flesh. So he's talking, this is the goal. Okay? This is what humanity is made for. But this world, that is the world we inhabit down here, this is mortal. Made for mortals. What does that mean? This is where death reigns. This is made for people to die in. When it was meant to be set up as a gift of lights, to be a proclamation of God by its beauty and size and his images enthronement. Okay? He's saying, now it is mortal. But it wasn't meant to be originally. Okay? It was meant to be set up as a gift of light. But both the first world and the last are in the great God's reckonings. In other words, but none of it's a surprise. God knew exactly what would occur. Okay? Which is why he then leads. I don't know if these are in the order that they show up in the manuscripts. I'm assuming they are. Which is why he then leads into the very next poem. Providence. 
because it's God's providential understanding and providential arrangement of the universe that makes everything work the way it does. So, look at line 7. It's not by chance the nature of such and so great a world wherewith nothing comparable can be thought. That is, we don't exist because 14.6 billion years ago, a couple of protein molecules slapped together and then, you know, landed on something. Whoever saw a house not built by hands? Whoever saw an iPhone that wasn't built in China? <laughs> I mean, that's essentially what he's saying. Whoever saw a pin, you know, fall down out of heaven like that? Who's seen a self-built ship or a fleet chariot, a shield and a helmet? Nor would so much have lasted through time minus a ruler. And the choir would have stopped, I'd say, without its conductor. What's his point? It's directed. It's directed. What else? Could it have come to be on its own? No. no. Why? There's design. It's the watchmaker analogy. Okay. There is design to what we see, okay? It might not be a pretty design. I mean, look at some cars and things that are made. Look at this building. Okay? <laughs> pretty good argument for a flawed designer. But, you know. <laughs> so he says, no, there's design to it. Line 31. But let's, let's assume for a moment that the others are right. If no one's in control... If there is no ruler out there, how will it stand? I don't see how. Now these people, by such notions, keep out God. For it's either God who guides or it's the stars. Astrology. Astronomy. But as for me, I know this much. God governs all these things. The word of God directing this way and that, everything. Above or below, that he set up by his thoughts. Above, that is in the heavens, he gave harmony and motion and ever during enduring constancy. Why are planets called planets? Anybody know? What's the difference between a planet and a star? What's the difference between a planet and a star if you observe them every night? The movements. Yeah, I don't remember specifically what it is about the movement. But... Planets move, stars don't. Planets move in relation to the stars. Orion's belt, you know, the three stars, hasn't changed for thousands of years. It always looks like that. Okay? But Jupiter and Mars and Venus and Mercury and all the other planets, they move across the sky. Planet comes from a Greek word that means wanderer. In other words, it strays. Okay? So what's he talking about? He's talking about the area beyond the planets where there is constancy. Here, however, what dominates? Changeable and varying many forms. Because we start off young, we grow, we get old, and we die. Buildings are built and then they fall apart. Nations rise, nations die. Civilizations come and civilizations go. Some of which things he's shown to us. Again, he stores in the layways of his wisdom, in his will to thwart man's hollow boast. In other words, it's, it's like, you know, Gregory is saying, some things God kind of keeps in secret, keeps in store, just to show us at the proper time to say, ah, 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 don't get so full of yourself. So look at 45. He said, okay, but you tell me of the hour's ascendance and the degrees of minutes. He's talking about astrology and alchemy in the zodiac system. Of z I don't know how you pronounce that word. Zodiacal? Zodiacal? <laughs> Circles 
and the measures of their course. You know, it's the Greeks who came up with Pisces and all of the names of the constellations and the system of the zodiac. Explain for me, too, the laws of life, and the dread that comes to sinners, and the hope again that finally meets the good. In other words, where do the stars say that evil sinners turn and become good? Where do the stars say or show certain individuals that they need to change? That's the dread of sinners. Well, why do they change for some people but not for others? Okay. For if the circle conveys all things, then by its revolution I'm whisked, and the circles even cause my very desire. That is, if the revolution of the planets and the stars and everything determines everything, then I'm not to blame for anything. Whatever I do, it was determined by the planets and determined by the stars and determined by the very motion of the universe. Therefore, I am not responsible for any actions whatsoever. Sorry, I forgot to turn my paper in, but it's not really my fault because the movement of the spheres for all eternity has determined that I would forget to do this on that very day. Therefore, you can't give me an F on the paper. It's, it's amazing uh, how, and I think it's really appropriate, and some things never change because in modern terms, it's uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, whatever random chemicals may be firing in your brain, uh, the television, um, there's any number of things that deliver you from any kind. It's a reduction. Faded to certain behavior. Yeah, it's a reduction, uh, reduction ad absurdum. Okay, he's essentially saying, you know, um, the the philosophical school that would describe this today is determinism. Mm -hmm. I am determined by events yeah. of the past, and those yeah. events of the past ultimately go to the founding of the universe, which set into motion the pool balls, and and we are nothing but life on the giant billiard table of the universe, okay? So, he says, that's where he says, there's nothing in me, there, there's neither in me some inclination toward what's better, whether of will or mind, but the firmament has flung me such a way. It's like the character in, it's like the character of, Edmund in Shakespeare's King Lear who he's speaking with his father Gloucester and Gloucester says oh look at the portents in the skies these eclipses and sun and such you talk about you know the eclipses suggest that there will be you know family strife and civil strife blah 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 and then Gloucester leaves and Edmund goes what a bunch of nonsense to say that I am the way I am because I was born under the tail of Capricorn. He says, nonsense. I'm the way I am because I'm a dirty, rotten, no good SOB. <laughs> and that's how I like to be. I mean, he just takes complete credit for his life. All right? Line 65. But these same heavens continue on that way which Christ the Lord ordained for them. Fiery, always running, undeflected, the fixed stars and the planets, those whose way returns, at, as it is said, whether they be of a nature of consuming fire or body, a quintessence, etc. But we ascend by our own road. In other words, the planets and the stars are in their movements because that's how Christ made them to be. But we, we do what? We grow by our own road. And what he means by that is to, um, to quote a great philosopher, Frodo Baggins, I shape my path. I choose where to put my feet down. Okay? For we strive for a rational and a heavenly nature, even though shackled by the earth. Notice that. We strive, though we're shackled, we're held as it were. Okay, 
And by saying that we're shackled, he's saying it's not easy. Okay? But we can't just say, oh, I am this way because the stars made me this way. Okay? Now, we're doing that one. Providence, Providence 2. Uh, number 7. Can, did I skip one? Concerning spiritual beings. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, and he's, what he's talking about here are angelic beings. Go down to about line seven. Truly, he is the fountain of lights. The light which cannot be named. Okay. Um, Book of James says God is the father of lights above. The light that cannot be named, the fathers will call the uncreated light of God. Okay. This is the light of his divinity, the light of his essence. It's not light like we think of it. It's not merely photons. It's because photons are created light. Okay? So we all we can say is it's uncreated. It's not light as we think of light. So he's um, the fountain of lights, the light which cannot be named, neither grasped, who flees from an intellect swiftly drawing near, forever outpacing the wits of all. It doesn't mean that God, you know, when somebody starts to get high and mighty and really starts to perceive God, God goes, oh, you know, I'm afraid they're going to figure it out. <laughs> no. It means the uncreated light is so far away, the mind can never get close to it. So that yearning, we might struggle anew for what is higher. Okay? That is to come as close as possible. But he says these again, these are secondary lights. Possessing from the Trinity a royal dignity, he's talking about angels. Invisible, who go about the great throne since they're nimble intelligences, blah, 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 blah. So skip down to 22. So then... Some of these are the great God's attendants. That is, some of these lights that he's talking about. Others hold sway in all the world by their preservations. That is, others preserve the world. They keep it intact. Each one holding from the Lord his own proper dominion. I think it is the book of Daniel talks about um, essentially each nation having its own ruling spirit kind of in charge of it, all right? Uh, observing men, cities, and every nation. And what he's talking about here is, I think it, I think it's also in Daniel where this is suggested, that you have not only a spirit an an, or angelic being in charge of a nation, but you might have one in charge of a city, a town, every individual, okay? The fathers will say, has a guardian angel. That at the moment that individual is born, the guardian angel is assigned to watch over, protect, and intercede okay, for that person on their behalf to God. And what do they do? They discern the reasonable offerings made by mortals. Okay? <clears throat> so it says, soul of mine, what are you doing? Reason trembles, entering upon heavenly beauties. In other words, you should stop going too far. But a mist has met up with me, and I can no better carry this discourse forward than retract it. In other words, I've gone as far as I can. I can't fathom, I can't logic my way any way forward. So, line 36... So likewise, when I draw close to the unseen deity, I dread to propose that those who attend the pure one who rules on high, a species filled with light, might sin. 
I dread to, pro I, I dread to even think that those who sit or stand constantly in the presence of God might sin, lest I should so smooth out for many a path of evil. But what is it that causes him to even propose the thought? Lucifer. One obviously did. Okay? Line 47. Um, so God put this kind of mind in me. So, first of all, the Godhead's hallowed nature always was unchanging. Never a many instead of one. Second, line 50, or the great assistance of the highest light, as close to the prototype splendor as is ether to the sun. That is, the, the highest rank of the angelic beings, depending upon which list you look at, it's either the cherubim or the seraphim. Okay, He says, they are the closest to what God is like in the created realm because obviously they're not close to God because God God is uncreated all right the third place atmosphere is us so what's he talking about you've got God first the splendor and then you have the great assistance the angelic beings and then you have us changeless is God's nature in all things the angels is hard to turn towards evil Ours, coming third, changes easily, being as far remote from God as from what's wicked. That is, our nature is as far remote from God as is what is wicked. And by saying our nature is as far remote from God as is what is wicked, what's he saying? He's saying it's like God is here, here's us, and here's wickedness. Notice, we're on an even mm -hmm. parallel, and we're both really far removed from God. So what he's getting at here is, how does one fall into evil? Okay, For the angelic beings, it's hard. You really, really have to work at being evil. Well, what did Satan have to do? He wanted to be like the most high. That's, it wasn't just, you know, golly gee, I just kind of wish. It wasn't a one-off thought. It was a striving for being equivalent to God. So it talks about Satan being lifted up, you know, seeking honor and such. And then line 63 or so. Nor did he wish God's creature to draw near to the divinity whence he'd fallen. Satan wanted the divinity, okay, and when Satan fell away, he wanted to then stop humanity. But notice the distinction between how Satan was created from how humanity was created. According to the fathers, humanity was created to participate in that divinity. The angelic realm wasn't. The angelic realm wasn't made in the same way in the image of God. To partake, to participate in God's divinity. Okay? So Satan wants to try and stop that as much as possible. Since he, Satan, longed to have humans with him in a common sin and darkness. What does Satan really want? He wants to pervert that, that goal of humanity. He wants humanity to not participate in divinity. He wants humanity to participate in him. He wants to be God in the same way. Okay? Because of this, he cast him out of paradise. So this then, top of page 60, was how the one aloft fell out from heaven's vault. But he didn't slip alone, but after arrogance destroyed him, there fell with him a multitude as many as he'd schooled in evil. Which, if you take the book of Revelation, one-third of the heavenly host. But through envy of the godly-minded choir that rules above, and because of the desire of most of these fiends for power. Notice that. Two reasons why they fell. Envy 
Okay. And they wanted power. So might he be suggesting something about humanity? Therefore there sprang from them evil beings on earth, demons, minions to the murderous king of evil, languors, I, I, I think languor, you know, like languishing, shades, ill-boding phantasms of the night, fairies, elves, okay? according to the Anglo-Saxons, fairies and elves were evil. Liars and revilers, instructors in sin, bamboozlers, souses, drunks, seducers, party animals, soothsayers, riddlers, warmongers, the bloody, the hellish, the lurking, the shameless, the high impostors, who beckon on approaching but hate when hauling off. I mean, he pretty much includes everybody there. It's not, you know... The offspring of the evil beings are giants and orcs and monsters and, you know, it's pretty much everybody who turns astray. So, line 83. Simply to do away with him was not what Christ had in mind in that will of his by which he made the entire world. And to annihilate him, he had only to wish on a sudden. But notice, Christ doesn't annihilate. God doesn't annihilate. Neither, though, did he let my enemy go scot-free. He set him loose halfway between the good and the evil and gave him bitter strife on either side, so as to have a dreadful shame also in this that he must fight his own subordinates so that strugglers for virtue should have eternal glory like gold refined in the furnaces of life. Okay? <clears throat> so he says, this is the army, this is the commander of all the evils in the world. But Christ didn't just, you know, snap his fingers and do away with them. No, what's he do? He puts them in relation to humanity and says, okay, now you have to choose. And makes it difficult. Why? So that those who struggle for virtue should have eternal glory, like gold refined in furnaces of life. So notice what life is described as there. It's not easy. Never said it was going to be easy. Or perhaps so that afterwards the stubborn one should render punishments in the setting of matter aflame. When fire shall be the retribution. Well, what will be the matter that will be set aflame? Sin and evil and wrongdoing, etc. Okay? These things then, the Spirit has taught me concerning the glory of the angels. Both the first kind and the last. Alright? Okay, that's seven. The next one on the Incarnation. Page 84. Okay, and I think what we'll do then is we'll probably just skip the comparison of wives. Um, since we're running out of time. <coughs> On the incarnation of Christ. Foolish, just read all of this one and then talk about a couple things. Foolish is she, excuse me, foolish is he or she who does not worship the ever existing word of God, the Lord, as equally God with the supernal Father. Foolish is he or she who does not worship the word, the Lord, a human here appearing, as equally God with the heavenly word. The one divides the word from the great Father, 
that is, one of the fools, okay, the other, our human form and fleshiness from the word. So the one is foolish who does not worship the ever existing word of God. Why? Because he or she divides the word from the Father. The other is foolish who um, divides the human form and fleshiness from the word because he does not worship the word, the Lord, as appearing here as a human, but who is yet eternally equal with the Father. Though being God, the Father's word, word took on our human being to mingle it with God and be little amongst earthlings. You know, how little? Well, born as a babe. He is one God out of both. One God, eternal, okay, and one God simultaneously as a child, needing his diaper changed. Being so human as to... And here he is, you know, almost channeling St. Athanasius. Being so human as to make me God instead of human. All right. Passing on his divinity. <coughs> Be merciful, O wounded one on high. Why O wounded one on high? Just reminding again that the Son is the Father. Um, no, kind of close, but the Son is distinct from the Father. They're the same in their godness, but, but, but the Fathers never say the Son is the Father, is the Holy Spirit. They say the Son is the Son, the Father is the Father, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. They are all God, okay? I guess I mean on high as in okay. the wounded one has... Right, so what does it mean by the wounded one? That there was real suffering? Yeah, it's to exactly. It, to going back to the idea of the sham and all of that. Going back it, against the docetists who yeah. say, it was just an appearance. It was a manifestation. Because what does Christ do when he comes back after, you know, when he's first seen by the apostles, and then he comes back eight days later and shows himself to Thomas. He shows his hands. Okay, now keep in mind, this is his resurrected, glorified body. But it still has wounds. Okay? So according to the fathers, when Christ ascended into heaven and, and, and now sits at the right hand of the Father, wherever that is, he sits with holes in his hands and a hole in his side and marks on his head from the crown of thorns. Okay? That's what he means. The wounded one on high. Meaning, God suffered. God became wounded. So let that much suffice you. In other words, that ought to be enough, shouldn't it? <laughs> what more have I to do with an ineffable mind and mixture? Ineffable. Ununderstandable. Incomprehensible. Both are God, you mortals. That is, the one hanging on the cross and the one ruling the universe. Be content with reason's limits. Don't try to reason beyond where we can go. So if I've won you over, much the better. But if you blacken the page with many myriads of words, and what he's implying here is, but if you start writing off, you know, diatribe and responses against me, come. And I'll inscribe these little verses upon tables with letters from my carving pen, which have no blackness in them. In other words, I'll literally carve it, okay? And it'll be what? It'll be permanent. You won't be able to do anything with it at that point. Okay, we'll stop there. And I think what we'll do then on Thursday um, is I think we'll, we'll just start with the lamentation concerning the sorrows of his own soul and see what we can get through in that uh, before we do any of the others. Remember, 17 and 18 I've taken off.